this kind of every Sunday. Every now and then we'll take a Sunday off, but we just kind of slowly march through the catechism. So for so, so this is adult Sunday school with a kind of secondary or primary focus on um, the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, and, and so the goal there is to use the catechism as a teaching tool to help us kind of understand Christianity better. The catechism is like a uh, it's like a, a general sketch of the whole Bible. It's like a child's drawing of the whole Bible. And so we can use that to help us kind of understand more about what the Bible says. Um, but this is also adult Sunday school or older youth Sunday school, high school, even junior high. And so uh, we also go over uh, anything. So what I, And I forget to do this, but what I want to do is open up each class saying, first of all, were there any questions about anything we said during the service? And then second of all, are there any just questions in general that you might have, which we may or may not talk about? Like, hey, I was wondering about evolution or universalism or whatever. And we may say, well, that's a really specific thing that nobody else is thinking about. We'll talk about that later, or we'll talk about it. And then if no one has any of that, then we go to the catechism. Does that make sense? Okay, so any questions about the sermon, anything we talked about, or just like a general life or general question about Christianity, general topic, Bob? So, as a guy knows, he, you know, he, 10 years ago, he essentially told his wife that you will be a stay-at-home mother, you're going to homeschool the kids because that's what Bible said you have to do. She's not allowed to you know, help out financially, she's not allowed to, you know be her own success in a sense. And I did I, I don't know, I disagree, but the two guys seem very wrong like on a personal level. And I don't know how it lines up with you know. Yeah. And he seems to quote he only quotes very one very small section of stuff. Yeah. Like and it's, and it's one or two verses and then, you know and then anytime anybody questions him on it, he just goes right into the side. You know? And so I'm trying to figure out how that lines up with, you know, but it just seems wrong. It's like, like, as I understand, you're supposed to respect your husband and, and, and you know, get your priorities straight and that, that always starts with the, the house, the family. And then that's, if those are in order, you can have something else for yourself. Right. It doesn't mean that you sacrifice everything you are for that. Right. Okay, so this is a question. This is a good question because, wrong word. Um, this is called complementarianism. Uh, we didn't really go over this like we should have in our new member class. So I'm really glad you brought this up uh, because this is something. This is a distinctive of our teacher first. I just actually had a whole class on this when I was at in my under. Actually, I'll leave it open. When I was uh, at Biola and my undergrad, we had a whole class on. Complementarianism, which is what we are, versus egalitarianism, which is another biblical view. The CRC is open to both. We at our teacher first teach one complementarian. You can only you can only pick one, but the CRC says you're allowed to choose either one. Okay, so um, the question is in terms of men and women in the marriage relationship, how do they interact? Two main views. Okay, the first view that I mentioned. It's called egalitarianism. That sounds like a twenty-five dollar word. I feel like. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but the the reason it's called that is because if you see this this prefix egal, it's like equal. Egalitarianism is equalism. It's saying men and women have equal roles. Their roles are undistinguished, other than you know men can't have babies, and women. Yeah, I don't know what women can't, you know, it, it's basically men and women are basically kind of the, the same. This is not like a man can yeah, be a woman or anything like that. This is a Christian biblical view that Rosewood CRC down the street has. This is not heretical. Um, this is just the view that the distinctions between male and female are uh, mostly about childbearing uh, and they are not in terms of their role. The roles are the same. Guy can, you know, I have a friend who I went to Biola with. So, and I think he was actually in this class with me, now that I think about it. And uh, he's a stay-at-home dad. So he stays home, his wife goes to work, he stays home with the kids. They have reversed roles. And he's a Christian. Egalitarianism. The view of our teacher first is complementarianism. And obviously you see complement here. 
And so the, the, the main point with complementarianism is that the male and female roles are different and they complement one another. Okay, so those are the two different roles. I, I don't have, I don't, I think the best thing for me to do is just describe to you the complementarian view, like you said, like your friend has, and the biblical um, justification for that as best I can. Obviously, I'm kind of going off the cuff, so I'm sure there's a lot. I got some good news for you, Pastor. Uh huh. I'm officially a member. <laughs> Glad to hear that, Joe. Yeah, well, you're not officially a member yet. You'll be officially a member after council votes on it, but I'm glad to hear that that's coming. Let's, okay, so well, well, let, let me teach this class, Joe. We'll talk about that after, okay? okay? Okay, so like I said, I'm kind of going off the cuff here, so there's, I'm sure much more that could be said and better things that could be said, but as far as I understand it, the complementarian view that men and women have different roles and that they complement one another, like all good doctrines of human life, it's rooted in the creation, right? So like Bob said, his friend will just kind of like isolate one verse. It's probably not good theology if you're picking some verse out of some epistle. Um, you know, when you're talking about like the way men and women interact, if it's like, oh, I, there's no verse that's describing my view until, you know, thousands of years after the creation, it's like, ah, it's probably not good theology, right? If God is creating man and woman, and for thousands of years of giving them the Bible through Abraham and through Moses and through David, he's probably going to tell them how to live their lives, right? So if you have to find something that's, that's only in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament, it might not, you might be misreading the New Testament, maybe. So like all good theology of the way men and women interact, it, you should see some of that in the creation in Genesis. You should see some glimmer of that. Right, and so this is this is actually exactly what the Bible does. So if you look at um, uh, Genesis chapter two, um, and you look at um, so in the creation of man and women, uh, <clears throat> verse twenty one. Chapter 2, verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, that's Adam, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God had fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man, out of man. Now look what it says here. So that's the first point. Eve is taken from the rib of man. I love the way... Matthew Henry, the old Puritan, um, the Puritan, he's Pur the Puritan, he's just Puritan. Uh, he, he was commenting on this verse, he says, Woman was taken out of the side of man, um, not, not out of his head to rule over him, not from his feet that, so that he could trample over her, but from his side so that they could be um, partners or loving partners. Love the way he says that. You'll hear that quoted in uh, <coughs> weddings all the time. Okay, so she's taken out of, so, so see, the first of all, who's created first? Adam. How did God create Adam? Taken out of the dirt. We're not going to go into whether this is literal or this is poetic language, but God takes Adam out of the dirt. He could have done that again, obviously. Chose not to. Creates woman out of man. So you see there's a primacy in the creation of man. Then you see in verse 24, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and he shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so we see that the man is kind of venturing out, leaving father and mother. Why? It doesn't say that the man shall leave his father and mother and the wife shall leave his father and mother. No, it says the man shall leave his father and mother. Why? Well, because the, wife, the, the woman was uh, under the spiritual authority of her family. And so the man goes and says, would you please marry me and create a new family with me? And then they break off and create their own family. So you see this leadership of the man, again, all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. Okay, now, so now we've got some good Old Testament backing. If you fast forward to um, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Sorry, this new Bible is hard for me to find stuff. First Timothy chapter two. No, yeah. 
Okay, so you look at First Timothy chapter 2. Now, Paul is here. I preached a sermon on this. Um, but Paul is talking about the church. So this is different than the home. There's a difference here. But in the church, he says, First Timothy 2, 11, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now, again, he's talking about the context of the church. Uh, there's a verse in here somewhere. Where he says explicitly, I am talking about the life of the church. So he says a woman's going to listen. She's not going to teach or exercise authority over a man. So that's where we at our teacher first say this is why we don't have female pastors. That's why I teach Everly. She can't be a pastor. Now Rosewood CRC, they have female pastors. They do a lot of uh, work to try to understand this passage in a different way. But, you know, it's, it's, in my opinion, very hard to get there when you look. I mean, it's very clear what it says. Now look what he says in the next verse, though. Here's the important point. 13. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. So we see Paul doing exactly what we talked about. He says, here's the way I want the church to work. And again, this is a different conversation than husbands and wives. But we'll get to husbands and wives. But Paul says, here's the way I want men and women to interact, and I'm basing this on the way that God created them in Genesis chapter 2. He quotes Genesis chapter 2. Okay, Now, he's talking about the church, not talking about the home. Paul is not saying women can't speak anywhere. Uh, he's saying women shouldn't be teaching other men in the church. You sh they shouldn't have authority over men. doesn't mean women can't have authority over children, over male children. They do here. Uh, you know, I hope they are wielding lots of authority over Robbie, because if they don't, he'll tear down the pink room, you know, so you have authority over children, male or female, uh, but uh, when in the context of the church, that, that's the way it works. Now, some people say, and, and uh, the, so, okay, I'm, I'm thinking of like all the different views, let me just stick to our view, okay, so that's the, that's the biblical view of life in the church, it should be male teaching, because that's the way that God uh, created men and women in the garden. Now, when it comes to the um, home, we see something, as you would expect, that's similar. Right? It's not the exact same thing, but it's similar in the home. Okay, so if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, and this is probably the verse that your friend was quoting. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 it says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their, hus ought to be to their husbands and everything. So subject, other translations say submissive. But Paul says the wives need to submit to their husbands. Okay, so what's Paul talking about? What Paul is saying is that husbands and wives have a complementary relationship. Um, and the way that Paul describes this, he says, here's what the relationship between husbands and wives should look like. Christ and the church. He says, look at Christ and the church, and that's the way husbands and wives should operate. Now, obviously, there's a difference in glory between Christ and the church are important. Christ is the most important. But he's saying, look at the way that they interact with one another. It's not, it's, not a, it's not the same in terms of honor. Christ is more honorable than the church. But at the same time, the church is the bride of Christ, and he makes it without spot or blemish. And he raises up the church to be, in a sense, equal with him because he marries the church. So, you know, you see this kind of interesting, like, Christ is preeminent, but then at the same time, he's bringing up the church to be his bride without spot or wrinkle or blemish. You see this interesting, I was like, wow, it's almost like they're being equalized. They're not, but almost like they are. But the important thing that Paul is drawing out is look at the way that they interact. Jesus doesn't come to the church and say, I'm in charge. Everything's going to be my way. And the, the rules that I'm going to lay down are going to be for my best interest. So, you know, I really like rock music. And so you can't play your beloved Dutch organ anymore. You got to play rock music, and I don't care if you don't like it because it's about my preference <laughs> and not your preference. No, Christ says uh, to the church, you know, uh, you know, I'm I'm guessing 
Christ's preference isn't the organ. You know, I don't know. There's a million different ways of worshiping, and Christ was on earth. I don't know what his preference is, actually. I don't want to guess what it is. But the point is, like, you've got organ, you've got rock music, you've got bongo drums in Africa, you've got a million different ways to worship, and Christ is uh, uh, um, justifying all that, saying that's all okay because it's not about his preference. What does he do? What, what, how does he interact with the church? He comes to the church, and he washes the feet of his disciples. Right? And so Christ comes to serve his bride. He gets on his knees and washes the feet of his disciples. He gets up on the tree on the cross and sacrifices himself and says, I'm willing to die for you. But at the same time, you need to follow me. I'm going to take the lead in this relationship. So complementarianism is, is saying in a way similar, not the same way, because men and women are equal in, in their value. But when it comes to roles, in the same way, husbands should take the lead with their wives, uh, but they should be willing to sacrifice themselves for their wives. And so Paul says in the next verse, Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right, so Paul is saying he wants the, um, the, the wives to submit to the husbands, let the husbands take the lead, and he wants the husbands to love their wives so much that they'd be willing to die for them. So, here's why society doesn't like that. I'm just going to cross this off because we're just going to talk about this this form, complementarianism. Society doesn't like that because they say, well, now the husband gets to pick where to go to dinner every night and where to live and where to go to church and yada, 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 yada. The husband is just, it just, me, well, this, I don't like complementarianism complementarianism because it means that the husband just gets his way all the time well i'm not saying you're saying that but i'm saying that's what society that's why society if you go out and ask a non-christian they they're like no, no, no it's just man. a heck of a leap to get from that to that that very right that's a very big leap without any understanding it seems like. exactly yeah so so when society is like oh, i don't like this because the man gets his way all the time and let's be honest a lot of men in the church treat complementarianism as they're just kind of golden ticket to do whatever the heck they want. Uh, you know, picking, and, and it, I mean, I just gotta give this example because it's fresh in my mind. When it comes to like choosing church, it's the husband's ultimate decision, but he should be making that decision in the best interest of his wife. A lot of times we see the opposite. The husband's like, oh, I just like it here. and This is where I wanna go. And the wife's like, I hate it here. And the husband's like, well, I get to pick. So we're going to my church. It should be the husband saying, well, where's my wife going to get best fed? Now, he might make that decision in a way that the wife doesn't like. She might want us to go to this church over here where she's real comfortable. And he's like, no, we're going to go over here because I think it's best for you. And the woman should submit to him. But the point being, the, the man's making the decisions not in his best interest, but in the best interest of the wife, just like Jesus does. Uh, with the church. So that's a biblical view of complementarianism. But a lot of people, th this is the opposite of the default mode in our society. If we grab one person off the street, I'd bet you anything if they weren't a Christian. I bet, I'm not a betting man, but I bet every dollar in my bank account that that person would say, no, there's no role difference between men and women. They, they're they completely equal. The man should not be calling the shots. That's antiquated. That's 1950s. That's misogynist yada 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 um, but the biblical evidence from genesis 2 1 timothy 2 ephesians 5 um, indicates that there is this distinction in roles between men and women okay yes let's go to rich first so i think we're basically we're talking about headship right right and um you, you talked a little bit about genesis but in genesis when uh, adam and eve sinned who does god go to first mm -hmm. Who, who sinned first? Eve sinned Eve first. Eve sinned first, gave the apple to Adam. But when God comes and says, what have you done? He goes to Adam first and says, why have you done this? Mm -hmm. Why didn't he go to Eve first? I think he didn't go to Eve first because there was headship there. Adam was kind of in charge of that of that training that Eve was supposed to get. And he didn't, he, he yeah. dropped the ball. Dropped the ball. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's why we have elders in the room because, yeah, that's a great point too. There's a lot of different things to say about this and that's another excellent point. I mean, again, there you see evidence that the way that God's created these, you know, God doesn't say in Genesis 
three and two. Man's going to take the lead, and Eve's and the the woman. He, you know, he doesn't write Ephesians five. Women submit, men love like Christ. He doesn't say that, but you see the evidence in it. The the man was first. Eve's from the rib. The man leaves his family. God goes to Adam first when they sin. That's probably the best evidence, actually, what Rich just said. But yeah, lots of that kind of stuff. And yeah, is the, the culture just absolutely hates this um, teaching because of the you know third wave feminism. Right. And uh, it's so practical. If you look at it, it literally permeates everything from the Godhead. I mean, Jesus, you know, so they're equal in value the, in the Trinity, but he submitted to the Father. And then you look at everything in culture from, uh, you know, CEOs, from business to warfare to athletics, everything. There's a, um, a hierarchy. And I see this as kind of a... Um, like when there's a stalemate kind of a deal breaker kind of thing you know it's it's not something that should really uh happen very often yeah. I, I don't think in a relationship it's the the best decision is one where both parties are enthusiastic about it yeah rich so uh, jack keeper said it this way one time a lot of people will look at this and they'll think well that god has a preference then for men right but he's he explains this way he says god does not have a preference but he does have a process, mm. and he chooses to, to bless women through their husbands. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the blessing flows through the husband to the wife, and then from the wife to the children. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I think this is a good verse, that, that you love one another as I have loved thee. See, I was going through that verse one Sunday morning, and then the pastor said that, I, I ended up in tears right in front of the whole church. I started to weep. And I wept because of that Jesus loves me, you know, and that the verse was quoted at the right time. That, that Jesus loves me, I wept to, to, to the whole Bible study. Thank you, Joe. I Real just, quick, before we go to Gene, a quick plug. Uh, women, the women's Bible study is going through Proverbs 31, and they're talking about how do we be, how can we become submissive wives? So a little plug, women, ladies, go to that wh Wednesday nights at 6.30. Wednesday nights at 6.30, right in this room, so come to that uh, if you're interested. Gene. Well, when you factor in what God says, the two husband and wife shall become one, mm -hmm. which hopefully will help his friend too. The wife now has uh, it, it's more of discussion uh, yeah. and coming to a meeting of the mind. You see, that's not what I'm thinking. It's it's when I see the word complementarianism, to me it's more like we, we balance each other out uh, in a sense. She like Christy's not doing everything I'm doing because she's different. And she's who she is. Right. Whereas I can't do everything she does. Right. We come together and then you know we make decisions. You know, I'll lead the conversation or she will, but eventually the decision is us making it. Right. And not, you know, I don't just walk in and say, rah. <laughs> <laughs> the, way, the way my buddy says it, it's, it's very Neanderthal. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that's why I brought it up because it's like, I don't, I mean, I see the one verse he quotes and it's like, and then when we start branching it out, it's like, he just goes silent. It's like, man, how do you, how do you just do that to a human being? You just say, okay, you're, this is what I'm telling you to do. And if you don't do it, go away. Right. Right. Yeah, that's we'll go come to you real quick, Olivia. But just a comment I didn't on mean that. Cut you off, but you, you, no. gave, you got my brain going on that. Was yeah. Did you have more to say, Gene, or was that? That's, that's all my wife wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but no, that's a really good point to bring up because there's actually one thing I want to make make really clear is that roles do not equal value, right? So there's difference in role no difference in value we have to we have to big, draw a big huge fat line in between roles and value the reason the world doesn't get this is because they say ceo better than guy mopping the floor right that's the way the world thinks the bible says sorry wrong you're all um there's none who are righteous no not one you're all equal and so if you're a ceo you're just doing something different than the guy mopping the floor mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big reformed concept we don't like the priests and the pope why? Because we're all sinners. I'm not. I'm not better than anybody in this room. I just have a different role. My role is to teach the Bible. It doesn't mean I'm a better Christian. I'm just different. 
So we got to get a real big fat line in between roles and values. Just because the roles are different doesn't mean the value is any different. That's the first thing. And so the second thing, like Bob said, is that when the way that this is fleshed out, it can be, there's, there's a failure on both sides. On the one hand, um, there's the kind of Neanderthal. I love the way you put that. And I'm definitely going to spell that wrong. So there's the Neanderthal mindset on the one hand, like, oh, you're just, you just do what I say, and I don't care what you think, and blah, blah, blah. But then on the other hand, there's this kind of abdication um, <coughs> mindset as well that says, well, you know, I'm the, I'm the spiritual leader of this house, and, you know, my wife is, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some example. I, like, what's that movie, Twilight? She's becoming obsessed with Twilight and idolizing the... What's his name? Like, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. But the I, vampires. The vampires know. thing that women got really oh. into. <laughs> women got really into this vampire thing. And so my wife is watching this for 12 hours a day, and she stays home from church because she wants to watch Edward the Vampire and his romantic escapades or whatever. And, you know, I'm not going to say anything because, you know, I don't want to offend her, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, your, your role as a man is to say, excuse me, honey, but, like, you know, we need to talk about this. This is an issue. I'm, I'm concerned for your soul. So it can go both. We can be the Neanderthals, but we have to also remember that we can also be abdicate our role. And that, like Rich said, is exactly what Adam did. Adam was like, okay, if you just have this conversation with the serpent, what should have Adam done? Should have ran up and said, serpent, stop talking to my wife, and stepped on his head. Olivia. who say they're oppressed because they're women, it comes from them being unhappy with their roles when it's, I think it's clear that women and men are equal, we're complementary as in, you know, men can't do a lot of things women can do easily. Mm -hmm. Men aren't nurturers, men aren't naturally empathetic, you know, can't yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But also, women So, okay, we'll, we'll end on this point. We're out of time, but uh, we're going to end on this. Which, what Olivia just said, really important. So there's no difference between role, or there is a difference between roles and value. Just because you have a, the, the male role is not more valuable than the female role, right? Uh, and part of the reason, like Olivia said, part of the reason society has such a problem with complementarianism. Part of the reason why you, if you're a complementarian and you tell a non-believer, yeah, I believe complementarianism, part of the reason society will say you're a bigot, you're a misogynist, or whatever, is because they think that certain roles are more important than others. So earning a living is seen in the eyes of our society as infinitely more important than bearing children, right? Staying home, watching children, raising children, society says bearing children, not important, 
earning a living important? And that is an absolute lie of Satan. I can go out there and sell insurance to people. I can sell them something that they can't touch. Right, no offense if you sell insurance. Insurance is important, but <laughs> coming up with an example. You know, I'm going to sell you something you're never going to hold in your hand. And you, let's say it's flood insurance, you know, and you know, you live in a hundred year floodplain and it's not going to flood there for every, but every hundred years. So you're not going to hold the insurance and you're probably never going to use it. And that's my job in life is to sell this stuff. Or like my cousin who is a banker, he says he sells money. That's his job. I could sell money. Now I'm not saying it's not important, but it's like, come on guys. Like it's not, you know, the world will continue to go on if you don't sell this hundred year floodplain insurance or whatever. Or I could bring new human beings into existence and guide them and shape them and point them to Christ so that they will become not just new human beings, but like Jesus and inherit eternal life in him and live forever with him and positively impact the kingdom by being Christian. They make disciples or I can do that. And society says, yeah, if you're, if you're working nine to five, it's more important than bearing children. It's just, a, it's just a satanic lie. The point is not that one's more important than the other, but that we need both. And typically speaking, the husband uh, earns the money. And so we, we could get in a whole different discussion of can the man stay at home and can the, can the woman work? That's a whole different discussion. But typically, you know, the man is, is guiding the family. Here's the direction I think we need to go. I feel called by God to sell insurance, let's say. And this is what God wants us to do. And so the wife is there to do what? What was Eve there to do? To be a helper to Adam. Okay, I'm going to help you sell insurance. I'm going to assist you in your role. And the husband's going to say, here's the direction I think we need to go. And so the wife is supporting him there. And it's not a, both roles are incredibly important. Society wants to say they're, they're not both important, but the Bible says they're both incredibly important. And we see that in, right when Paul says, I don't want women to be preachers, 1 Timothy 2, right after that, he says, women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Right? He's saying that part of the preservation of, of womanhood is through the bearing of children. Paul is saying, like, we don't want women to do this, but you're going to literally preserve the rest of womankind through childbearing. Like, it's an incredibly important thing. It's, so we hear, don't women shouldn't preach. We're like, oh, that's terrible. It's misogynistic. It's like, no, Paul's, Paul, the Bible is saying, we don't want you to do this, but we want you to do something else that's also very, very important. If there was nothing but preachers in the world and no women to, to make babies, we'd be preaching to nobody, right? So preaching isn't more important than childbearing. You've got to have both. Okay, we'll close now. Uh, and if you want to talk after, we can, we can talk right after. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this class. Uh, thank you that we get to discuss the way that you've created men and women. Uh, Lord, it's hard for us sometimes to believe that, but help us, Lord, to believe your truth, even when it's uncomfortable, because it's always good for us and it glorifies you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.